Wow. A condensation party for monosaccharides to meet and bond. Which molecules do you think can attend this party? Cryos? Anthos? Axos? Well, turns out for this condensation party, it's going to be all about the hexoses. Let's open the door. Now, in the party room, there were disaccharides waiting to welcome the hexoses. And there was a lot of meeting, greeting and bonding between monosaccharides. Now, this is BioWorld's attempt to introduce condensation. Welcome. In today's video, I'm covering syllabus part B. That is the formation of glycosidic bond in disaccharides such as maltose and sucrose. I'll also be touching on polysaccharides such as starch and glycogen. So let's begin. Let us recollect the activity in the party room earlier. You could see there was a lot of movement by the monosaccharides, hexose specifically, that were welcomed into the condensation party. So, the first rule is condensation involves two monosaccharides. The monosaccharides can be glucose and glucose or they can be glucose and fructose. Now, what happens when they meet is they form a friendship in the form of a covalent bond. Now, this covalent bond has a name it's called the glycosidic bond. Now, when they meet and form this glycosidic bond, water is formed. So, that is why it's called the condensation process. And we find the product of this bonding is a disaccharide where glucose and glucose will condense to form a maltose and glucose and fructose will condense to form a sucrose. Now, this is the brief introduction to the process of condensation. Let us look at the details. I'll start with the condensation between two glucose molecules to form maltose. For the condensation process, illustration of the process is important. So, I'll start first by drawing a ring structure of an alpha glucose molecule. I've introduced ring structures as well as alpha glucose in my video on carbohydrate part one. So please view this video to refresh. Now a glucose molecule is hexagon in structure, but please remember the arrangement of the carbon. Carbon one is the rightmost. Then following a clockwise manner, you have carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. And carbon 6 is positioned above carbon 5. Do not make the error of putting carbon 6 as the 6th corner of the hexagon. This corner here is for the oxygen atom that is shared by carbon 1 and carbon 5. Next, remember if we are talking about an alpha glucose molecule, then the hydroxyl group at carbon 1 will be positioned below while the hydrogen will be positioned above. So I'll draw another alpha glucose and position it side by side. Now at this location, you can see the hydroxyl groups of carbon 1 and carbon 4 will become attracted to one another and the oxygen will start to draw onto the hydrogen, leading to condensation and formation of a water molecule. Now, oxygen can make two bonds, 
presently, this oxygen has one bond at carbon-4. So, it will do its second bond with carbon-1 by pulling the alpha glucose closer. So now you see the oxygen atom is being shared by both carbon-1 and carbon-4. So, this covalent bond that has formed is called alpha 1 4 glycosidic bond. Alpha because we are using alpha glucose. 1 4 because the glycosidic bond is between carbon 1 and carbon 4. So condensation has helped combine two glucose molecules. The formula for a maltose or any disaccharide will be carbon 12, hydrogen 22, and oxygen 11. So over here, the hydrogen and oxygen is less by two hydrogen and one oxygen because this has been removed in the process of condensation. Let's move on next to sucrose. Sucrose is the condensation between a glucose and a fructose. So we have our alpha glucose structure here and beside it, we'll draw the structure of fructose. The fructose ring structure is different from the glucose ring structure because although fructose is a hexose, but it is different from glucose because fructose is a ketose. Now I've introduced all these terms in my carbohydrate part 1 video, so please view to refresh. Now let me explain the arrangement of the carbons in a fructose molecule. Now the carbon, the first carbon, has to be on the leftmost. Then we follow anti-clockwise, that is carbon 1 followed by carbon 2 here carbon 3 at the bottom, carbon 4 beside, then carbon 5 goes up. Now remember, you do not end the pentagon with a carbon 6 above. Instead, you look down here at carbon 6. So, you can see now that the oxygen for fructose is shared by carbon 2 and carbon 5. Okay, We have to draw it this way because if you flip the fructose molecule the other way, then you will not get the hydroxyl groups side by side. So please do not mistake and start writing carbon 1 on the right. Carbon 1 has to start from the left. Only then you can have the hydroxyl groups reacting to carry out condensation. So once water forms, the same situation, the oxygen in carbon 2 will bond with carbon 1 that is free. So the monosaccharides are pulled closer together. And now we have a covalent bond and we can label it as alpha because we are still using an alpha glucose but this time the bond is between carbon 1 and carbon 2. So it's called alpha 1 2 glycosidic bond. Okay, Although the bond is different but the chemical formula for a disaccharide remains C12H22O11. Condensation is very much like a love story where the monosaccharides meet and permanently bond via condensation by releasing water. So here you have the sucrose couple bonded by alpha 1 2 glycosidic bond and here is the maltose couple bonded by alpha 1 4 glycosidic bond. But the water that is formed can do the opposite of condensation, that is, it can break the glycosidic bonds. This breaking of the glycosidic bond is known as hydrolysis. So when that happens, 
the disaccharides will separate into individual monosaccharides once more. Now that we understand condensation in the formation of a disaccharide, let's move on to polysaccharides. You just saw condensation happen repeatedly. This is also known as polymerization. And in this molecule, every condensation will lead to formation of glycosidic bonds. So the longer the molecule, the more the glycosidic bonds form. The formula for such a large molecule will be C6H10O5 bracket N. N will determine the length of the polysaccharide. And you see the formula inside here is similar to a monosaccharides formula, but it is less by two hydrogen and one oxygen because the H2O will be removed to form the glycosidic bonds. Now the N can be short between 3 to 10 or the N can be very long up to 10,000. So based on the length of N, short molecules are called oligosaccharides while the long molecules are what we call as polysaccharides. So now I'm going to introduce polysaccharides to you. There are two ways in which a polysaccharide can be formed. The first way is through the condensation of alpha glucose molecules. This will form either starch that you find in plants or glycogen that you find in animals. Now you can also condense beta glucose to form cellulose which you find in the plant cell wall. I'll focus next on starch. Starch is actually made up of two different polysaccharides, amylose and amylopectin. They are both polymers of alpha glucose, but the way the condensation happens makes the arrangement of the molecules different. You see, amylose is a long linear molecule. Whereas amylopectin is a branched molecule. So when you mix both amylose and amylopectin together, you get starch. Now let me go into the details of each of the polysaccharides, starting with amylose. As mentioned, amylose is a long unbranched chain where the alpha glucose molecules are bonded together by alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond, just as introduced to you when we discussed maltose. The alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond can be broken down or hydrolyzed by the enzyme amylase. So you see, those days when you studied the topic of digestion, some of you may have wondered why the enzyme to break down starch was not called starchase but called amylase instead. You see, the enzyme amylase was actually breaking down amylose to produce maltose. I hope you are more clear now on the questions you had when you were studying digestion before. Amylose is a long molecule, so it tends to twist and form a helix. This helix pattern is more stable for amylose because when it twists, you find that the hydroxyl groups at carbon 2, carbon 3 and even carbon 6 will be inside the helix. So the advantage of the hydroxyls being inside the helix is they will start to do hydrogen bonding inside. So like the way I am drawing here, you can see these red lines are the hydrogen bonds that will hold the helix together. This is the reason why starch cannot dissolve in water. However, if 
you mix starch in hot water, starch will dissolve because the hot water actually breaks the hydrogen bonds. Next, I move on to amylopectin. Amylopectin is short and it is branched. And we find there are actually two different bonds involved in the formation of amylopectin. The linear parts of the amylopectin are just like amylose, that is made up of alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. But you see the places where the branch occurs. The branching has a different glycosidic bond that is alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Now we are familiar with the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond on the linear part of the amylopectin. I'm going to introduce to you how the branch part forms. This occurs when an alpha glucose is positioned above the linear chain. Then you find the hydroxyl group in carbon 1 of the alpha glucose that is going to make the branch will be corresponding with the hydroxyl group from carbon 6 in the alpha glucose on the linear chain. So what will happen is condensation between the hydroxyl groups of carbon 1 and hydroxyl group of carbon 6. Water will form and this will cause oxygen of carbon 1 to be free and bond with carbon 6 from the linear chain. So this way now you have got a branch and this new branch has the covalent bond alpha 1 6 glycosidic bond. So this is how two bonds form in amylopectin. The next polysaccharide is glycogen. This is a polysaccharide found in the muscle and liver tissues of human as well as animals. If you look at the diagram for glycogen, you will notice that it has a lot of similarities to amylopectin. It is branched just like amylopectin and it has the same two bonds. That is, the linear part is bonded by alpha-1,4 glycosidic and the branch parts have alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds. But then there are differences too. First difference is that glycogen is more soluble than amylopectin. And the reason for that is the second difference. Glycogen is shorter than amylopectin. And on top of that, we find that glycogen has more branches compared to amylopectin. To the end of today's video, where we've completed our discussion on glycosidic bonds found in maltose, sucrose, starch, and glycogen, I just refresh you. The glycosidic bonds were alpha-1,4, alpha-1,2, and alpha-1,6. So in my next video, I'll talk about cellulose. Bye-bye.